Good day. My name is Jing Sun Liu from Huawei headquarters. A couple of days ago, ITU just approved 3GPP specification as the only 5G standard. So compared to 3G and 4G, we now have only one single standard technology for 5G. But the questions regarding bands remain. Which bands can we use for 5G? And which bands the carriers worldwide has been using to deploy 5G? Today, we're going to address the question of which bands for 5G in the following section. We've been hearing a lot of talk about C band, but as, as a matter of fact, 5G can be deployed over high band, mid band, or low band with different rhythm and timing and with different usage and use cases. Most 5G starts with C band, offering both decent coverage and capacity. And as per ITU recommended, uh, we should have a contiguous 100 MHz per carrier. It can be supplemented by high bands such as millimeter wave for the EMBB hotspot or wireless home broadband access. It can also be deployed over low band to offer wider coverage or better uplink. Like LTE, we started a carrier bandwidth of 20 MHz, but in 3GPP specification, we have extended the carrier bandwidth to include 30, 40, and 50 MHz, as is the case for the bands 2.1 GHz and 700 MHz. So let's look at the spectrum allocation worldwide. By the GSMA study of February 2020, we have at least 40 markets who has assigned suitable frequency for 5G. It could be C-band, it could be 2.6 or 2.3, or other bands such as 700. Some select markets with the frequency allocation is put in the table on the right side. It could be seen that the majority of countries have selected C-band for 5G because this actually is the lowest frequency band that we can find a large span of contiguous frequency available worldwide and it offers a decent compromise between capacity and coverage. Nevertheless, when C-band is not available, we resort to other frequency bands as well, such as the case for the Nathans. At the time of recording, the Nathans is carrying out auction of 700 megahertz, and 3.5 will not be available until 2022. Therefore, as a sum of rule, we should have uh, between 80 megahertz or 100 megahertz per carrier for mid-band as per recommended by GSMA. This is the case for the markets including China, European markets, and uh, Japanese market or South Korean markets. In case we don't have sufficient uh, spectrum for the 3.5, band 41 in 2.6 or band 40 in 2.3 gigahertz can also be considered. Regarding 2.6 gigahertz, there are actually two modes of allocation, either as a combination of FTD plus TDD or as a single chunk of 194 MHz contiguous band in band 41. For the reason of efficiency and capacity, we recommend mode 2. This has been also the choice for a number of countries, including Japan, including China or the US. Here comes the question asked by many. Since N38 is a subset of N41, how does the N41 device interoperate with N38 network and vice versa? The answer lies to the following. For N41 devices, it does not only get the signals from the N38, but it also possibly get the interference signals from N7. Two other mid-bands in 2.3 and 4.9 are less ready or deployed than 3.5 or 2.6. For 2.3 GHz, it has been largely deployed in LTE and it has a large support of devices. We expect 2.3 GHz to continue the momentum in 5G. Uh, we already have a number of devices in phones, CBS and modulus being supporting um, 2.3 and has been allocated in a number of markets. Regarding 4.9, as a matter of fact, our first 5G device as early as 2018 already support uh, 4.9. One thing worth mentioning is China Mobile has mandated the support of 4.9 for 
for its 5G devices. Regarding the spectrum, beside China, it has also been allocated or trialed in Japan and Russia. China Mobile is also considered using Photo 9 for the vertical segments, where a special uplink downlink ratio is used in order to improve the uplink throughput. So let's take a look at the midband availability in countries worldwide. As we can see that when you have at least 80 megahertz per carrier uh, for the midband, we are in the green zone, meaning with sufficient midband resources. But we do have the mortgage, such as Turkey or Russia, which is below the threshold of 50 megahertz per carrier, meaning that they are facing the challenge of insufficient midband in the short term. After the spectrum allocation, let's take a look at what kind of bands carriers has been using for the commercial launches. According to the most recent study from the GSA, we have 84 live 5G networks today, mostly in Europe, Asia Pacific, and Middle East. Now, if we take a look, close look at what kind of bands they have been using for the commercial launches, it is without doubt that 3.5 is the most used band for all the carriers, followed by 2.6, and 2.1 gigahertz. Now let's take a look at the number of devices being commercially available. When we look at the breakdown in terms of bands, it perfectly matches the bands for the commercial networks. You have the most devices being available in the C band, followed by the M41 of 2.6, and then followed by 2.1 and 1.8. The form factor breakdown sets a lot of focus on the EMBB on the fixed wireless access and on vertical use cases with 5G modules. We've seen that the majority of carriers go with 3.5 or 2.6, but we do have carriers who has no access to such bands. That's when the carriers resort to sub 3G bands for fast 5G deployments, as is the case for carriers such as T-Mobile in the Netherlands. It can also be used for fast deployment and the supplemental coverage for C-band. In many countries such as Germany, when the uh, spectrum is auctioned, there's a mandatory coverage requirement. Last, but certainly not least, it can also be used to improve the uplink and to reduce the latency. As was the case for China Telecom, we have been working closely with China Telecom to offer super uplink, which leverage both C-band and 2.1 gigahertz to offer a higher uplink throughput. Regarding the 3GPP specifications, we can see that sub-3G bands are generally enhanced with a number of options in anchor and in ENDC combinations. In 3GPP specifications, we can see that sub-3G bands are generally enhanced with a number of options in Anchor and in ENDC combinations. Moreover, the channel bandwidth has also been extended beyond 20 megahertz. For example, that's uh, possible to have 30 or 40 megahertz for 700 megahertz, as was demanded and advocated by China Broadcast Network. The uptake of sub-3G NR we forecast there will be a few 5G launches by the end of this year, notably in 2.1, 700, and 1.8. So after all the discussion on C-band, sub-3G NR, and the millimeter wave, the next question will be, what should be the next band for 5G or 5.5G? We believe that a very likely candidate light in the 6 gigahertz band because of its availability in most geographic regions and because of its availability of 1.2 gigahertz contiguous band. Considering the long time between the um, study and the commercial launch, as was the case for C-band, we recommend the speeding up the process starting uh, from 2019 as a research project. We should streamline the process and target marking 6 gigahertz for IMT usage in WRC 2023, and we should target the first commercial case for 6 gigahertz as early as 2025. Here comes the 
summary for the question which bands full 5G. We recommend at least 80 to 100 megahertz per carrier in order to offer the 5G data bit rate as per recommended by ITU or GSMA. First wave 5G starts with uh, 3.5 gigahertz or 2.6 gigahertz to be followed by N40 um, in 2.3 or 4.9 gigahertz. Sub 3G NR is gaining momentum as witnessed by the number of deployments starting with 2.1 gigahertz and 700 megahertz. As 4 millimeter wave, it finds its usage in EMBB hotspots or fixed wireless access due to its limited coverage. Uh, that's all for the section answering the question which bands for 5G.